From time to time, we have the opportunity here at Crossroads to talk to people who are of international stature, who represent ministries that uh, are proven and known all around the world. One of those ministries is L'Arche. Uh, a lot of you are aware of the fact that uh, Jean Vanier, uh, son of a former Governor General of Canada, years ago formed this remarkable community for uh, people that had been marginalized, in many cases disenfranchised because of physical or mental or emotional uh, stresses in their lives. And uh, it has become uh, a model to the world of uh, care for, for those that uh, society tends to uh, uh, diminish. Well, Sister Sue uh, Mosteller is his, um, was his uh, uh, not only uh, friend and, uh, and uh, colleague in the ministry, but she actually succeeded him when he finally passed over the responsibility to someone else and has been living in France for over 40 years, and she is here to, uh, to talk to us. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you so welcome, much, Jim. Welcome. Yeah. How many years did you uh, head up L'Arche? About 10, About 10, but I did it from here. I didn't do it from France. You did it from here? I did it from here. I've been in the community of L'Arche Daybreak just north of Toronto in Richmond Hill. Ah, now, I'm just getting to know you, so I, my, the bells start going on here. Okay. This, this, is, this would make you an associate uh, and a friend, probably, of Henry Nouwen. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. No, Henry and I became very good friends. He was there for 10 years, and uh, very, very good. Yeah. yeah. Good for us and good for him, I think. Well, for sure. Now, a lot of people don't know what L'Arche is. As, as famous as it is, tell us what it essentially is. It's a, a community where we welcome people who have intellectual disabilities primarily. And the optic that John Vanier uh, had when he began was simply to live together. So we create home with people who have disabilities and we share gifts and we com create community together. And when you say share gifts, you mean personal ministry gifts, or are you talking about material gifts? I'm talking about ministry gifts. I'm talking right. about personal relationships. Right. The, the, the real foundation of this is relationships, because someone who has a, a disability is longing to recognize that they are accepted by others. Uh, they've so much lived the marginalization of their handicap. So. Uh, we just try to form relationships. We become really good friends. I, I, my friends and my, they have become, many of them, my friends and my mentors with the spiritual journey and with life. And that has been my amazing discovery that at the beginning I thought I was going to help people. <laughs> and what I realized was I was on my head uh, standing because they were the ones who have so many gifts of the heart. Mm. And as I began to enter into really profound friendship with people with disabilities, I, I found very, very unlikely teachers in the spiritual life. Now, uh, I've seen uh, Vanier uh, interviewed, and he says much the same. Uh, and only those of us who have been in any context where there's a lot of suffering and a lot of disadvantage can, can really understand what, 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 what they mean. But when you talk about this, first of all, how do you relate to someone who has a, a very significant intellectual disability? Uh, perhaps they can't talk. Uh, perhaps they can't control uh, physical actions. Exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, they they uh, may, may be given to outbursts. Uh, how 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 do, how do you how do you find your way through to their heart? That's so interesting. Right away, I think of Tracy, who lived who lived in our community. She's dead now, but she lived in our community. A little woman who had very very severe uh, cerebral palsy. Mm. So her little body was just spastic. And of course, she never spoke a word in her life, but she spoke lots with her eyes, with her heart. And I think the key is something about finding a different way in mm. terms of the relationship, because we depend so much on words. Yeah. But when you enter into something like this with Tracy, she told us so many things just by the way she looked at us, by the way she laughed, by the way she cried. Uh, she could tell us very, very many things about what was going on in her heart. Well, isn't it true that even uh, among fully abled people, uh, most of our communication is nonverbal? Well, I would say that. Yeah. And uh, if we're reading the signs, we can see beyond the words often to something that's much deeper. Um, we tend to um, um, 
perhaps gloss over the fact that even though people have uh, physical and intellectual uh, disabilities, they're also human beings. Uh, and from time to time they get angry, right? That's right. Uh, they can be very selfish. Absolutely. They can be very demanding. Absolutely. Uh, and the tendency is to say, oh, the, the, the poor soul, uh, you know, overlook this bad behavior. Uh, how did you handle bad behavior? <laughs> We just try to work with individuals on an individual basis. Yeah. I mean, we don't have great policies or anything. No. I think uh, one of the things is that people are distressed and often their behaviors of anger and aggression and so on are quite natural because of what they've lived and that they're very frightened of relationships and they've been wounded very deeply and so therefore they lash out to protect themselves. And so we have to find the way to just uh, wait and listen and be present to them and accept them as they are. I mean, there's a there's a, that statement of Jesus in the gospel which has come to me to come to life for me. I would say, and that is, he says, "Blessed are the poor," yeah. and he doesn't say, "Blessed are those who care for the poor." Yeah. So, what I've discovered, what happened first for me was that I began to discover people who were so precious and so beautiful. With, with inner gifts that I long for. But then the next movement for me was to discover how poor I am. Mm. <laughs> and therefore I could discover my own blessedness, not where I have gifts of, uh, you know, I'm able to s I'm articulate things, I can manage, I can organize. That's not, but the real beauty is in letting develop the gifts of the spirit in the heart. and. That's where I'm very poor, forgiveness. You know, I get resentful, I get angry, I get, just as everybody else does. And how do I deal with that? How do I live with that? And that's where I just found the way I watched people sort of coming to life two, three, five, seven years before someone begins to become peaceful, but begins to believe that finally they might be lovable. Uh, you watch that happening and then you say, well, I need time to, and uh, so I need time to develop compassion and not resentment. Five, six, seven years in some absolutely, cases? Absolutely, absolutely. They've been trained by masters. I mean, uh, hatefulness, uh, marginalization. Rejection? Rejection. Yeah. And the, the trained, all I can say is they, they've learned from the masters and it's very deeply in, embedded within them. In, in all of your experience, uh, can you think of an example, this may be unfair, of a breakthrough moment in, in some person's life that you can recall where uh, the light dawned and, and they, they began to realize that, hey, I am loved and I am valued? You know, occasionally you see it in a moment. It's right. mostly over time. Right. But we had a a young man who was very, very distressed, really, really overweight, very frightened of friendship and of relationships and so on. And just the day he stopped and said, I'm my mother's son and I think my mother did love me and maybe she found it hard to love just like I do. And it was like suddenly he was aware that he was okay. And he was aware from the point of view of his mother who knew him better than anyone else, you know. And I, I had goosebumps. I was sitting there listening to him. I just said, that's so beautiful. Mm. He was just smiling. It was like he sort of rose up to say, I'm here and it's okay. And I'm not what everybody expects, but it's all right to be who I am. What about... Um uh, faith. Um, are you aware of some of these precious people uh, consciously embracing the love oh. of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ? And if so, how, how does that happen? I don't know how it happens. But it happens? <laughs> but it happens. And again, as I say, um, God is present to them in a way that God has not been present to me. Yeah. So if we say, you know, how did you meet God today? Well, God was on the bus with me. And I'm saying, I was on the bus, but <laughs> I didn't know God was there. God was on the bus with me, or God told me, be careful, don't get angry too fast, wait a minute, hold on. That's what God told me, so that's what I did. So there's a, 
God is working. God is working. And uh, so many of the people, you know, we, we celebrate. We have great celebrations and we're all killing ourselves laughing. We're, we're having a great time and everything. And then when, when it's time to close, we say, okay, let's just stop now and pray together. Suddenly, peace, just silence. And then somebody will reach for somebody's hand. And silence. And you would think, you know, people couldn't sit in five minutes. And then somebody prays a little bit and, and we're just together, you know. And then we sort of stand up and give each other a little sign of peace and then we go home. But I'm always so amazed that we're in hilarity. Mm. And within seconds, we say, well, you know, let's, it's time to go. Let's, let's just gather. Or at the dinner table, we always end with prayer. And so at the dinner table, we're throwing orange peels and everybody's all wild and we're having a lot of fun. And then at the end of the meal, we say, well, should we pray? And okay, silence. And then people just start to pray. I want to pray for my mother and I want to pray for my father. And they name the same people day after day. And it's, it's very, very wonderful, all the people that they carry in their hearts and that we carry. There's an atmosphere of prayer. It, it happens. It's right. not there all the time, right. for sure, but it happens. And again, sometimes it doesn't happen. That, that's uh, so normal. But it surprises me that it happens so suddenly to go from one state to the other. So for me, it's, it's, the meal is really a celebration. It's a celebration where we're nourishing ourselves with food, but we're, always, we're, we're also nourishing ourselves with relationships. Mm. And then to recognize who is the author of all our nourishment at the end and to stop and just make that presence known. So there is a, a beauty there. And of course, you, you live a day after day, every day it's different. And it uh, doesn't happen every day beautifully. It happens in chaos sometimes. If you had to do it all over again, would you do it the same way? Or would you do something differently? I, I think, you know, I just look back and I'm so grateful for what I, I hated it and I loved it. I, I was very schizophrenic about the whole thing. I mean, Lars just took me way beyond where I wanted to go. It dragged me. I drew the line in the sand and I said, no farther. And then I'd get dragged across that line and then no more, I'm not. And then oh, you get pulled across. So um, I don't think I'd change it because I think it was the path that God intended. and. Uh, God walked with us and uh, helped us along the way. That I've, I'm certain of that. Mm. I don't know how we would have done it otherwise. I, I knew nothing about people with disabilities beforehand, so I just went from nothing to uh, a very, very deep conviction about the Beatitudes. Wow. Um, Henry Nowen would have been a good coach for you. He was, he was great, and, and we were a good coach for him. Yeah. I think we needed him at the time that he yeah. came. He was so open. Uh, we were, we're, we're a community. We don't really uh, look at the faith of somebody. Right. We welcome people because they have disabilities. Yeah. So we have a very big mixture. And at the beginning, in the early 70s, uh, it was hard. And, you know, we were kind of all clinging to my form of worship. I like to worship this way, and I like to pray this way. And um, so we had to learn a lot, and we struggled a lot, and we hurt each other. And when we said to Henry, we need a pastor who really can help us because we have a lot of problems. And the first thing that he said to us is, the fact that we're together, all people from different backgrounds, is not a problem. We have to see it as a gift. Yeah. And then we work from there. So he brought us a long, long way. We need another hour here, uh, Sue, <laughs> but uh, our time is gone. Uh, your order is? Sisters of St. Joseph of Toronto. Sisters of St. Joseph of yeah. Toronto. Well, God bless you. Thanks. What a, what a powerful ministry. And friends, uh, if you don't know uh, about Larsh, now you know a little bit. Um, is there a website? Oh, yes. What uh, is it? Larsh International website. There's a Larsh Daybreak website, Larsh Canada website. So just Google Larsh. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> apostrophe, A-R-C-H-E, and yeah. you can get into this whole universe of amazing ministries going on around the world. Thanks so much.